Deforestation and wildfires have been a concern for a while. They contribute to climate change, they contribute to biodiversity loss, and they threaten the livelihoods of millions of people. And with Amazonia, with Australia, and now with California, the issue might have been a defining feature of the year 2020 if it had not been for the pandemic. And yet the pandemic has not stopped the ecological catastrophe, on the contrary. And this is especially visible in the Amazon rainforest to which we will dedicate the next hour and a half. The Amazon represents over half of the planet's remaining rainforest and holds the largest freshwater basin in the world and comprises the biggest and most bi biodiverse tract of tropical rainforest in the world. It is vital to the Earth's carbon regulation and its protection is crucial to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement. We all need the so-called green lungs of the world, but they're also home to 33 million people, among which are many indigenous peoples. Current trends in the region are of grave concern, though. The rate of deforestation since the inauguration of Joe Bolsonaro as Brazilian's president in January 2019 has risen dramatically and is now also spurred by the COVID-19 crisis. Even previously, though, deforestation has continued. And we will today look at the complex social, political and economic causes of deforestation and land degradation in Amazonia. And we will debate on how EU policies can protect this unique natural environment and make its populations thrive. The conference now consists of a presentation of some of the key messages um, of the study by the author himself. And then we have comments by representatives from the European Commission, from the European Parliament and from civil society from the ground. And at the end, we will have the panel discussion where you all can participate. Um, without further ado, I now give the floor to Thomas Fatoya, who is the author of the study. He has a PhD in social science and has lived and worked in Brazil for 18 years. Among other things, he headed the office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation there. And since 2010, he has lived in Germany again and is an active author and consultant. And as such, he has published numerous studies and articles on the situation of the Amazon rainforest. So please, Thomas provide us with your most val valuable insights on the Amazon regions and your study. You now need to request to speak and come on stage. I confirm Lisa, we are waiting for Thomas. Okay, here he comes. Thomas? Yes, there he is, right? Uh, hello, uh, bom dia, eu vou falar em português. Uh, então, fazemos a tradução em... Uh... Speaking in English. I must say that Thomas' connection is... Failing. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you. Yes. We can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Thomas. Can I, can I go on? Yes, you may go on, please. As far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak. The English translation. Can I turn off the English translation because I can hear myself and the English translation says Thomas. That this is a technical issue. Well, let's go on then and start again, please. <clears throat> Well, good afternoon or good morning, according to the place where you are. Thank you for the opportunity to, to um, present this study that Lisa uh, uh, mentioned. Well, the idea of the study was to have to a resume of what we know about Amazon uh, and make do a kind of a bridge between uh, what uh, the scientific data and more. Uh, popular or more common articles in from the press for example knowledge from the from what we all know so this is uh, scientific data 
but also what we know publicly among ourselves. So there's a bridge that I'm going to try to make between these two knowledges. The first slide, let's see if we can, can you see the first slide? I, I don't see the slides. We don't see the slides. This is an experiment in Amazonia. Well, 2004, I don't know if you can see the slides. You can't see the slides. Well, I can't see the slides. Well, 2000 and... Well, there's the start of the presidency in Brazil. And then there's the environmental minister. And the fact that the government had to take some serious measures. The big owners, landowners, were afraid of certain measures taken by the government at that time, Lula's government. And from 2004-2005, uh, deforestation uh, dropped significantly. There was a, a very big reduction of the deforestation. So it, this proves that it was possible to reduce deforestation. So it's not out of reach. It is possible, uh, I repeat. Then two measures were consensually uh, needed. First, uh, raise the number of uh, protection areas or protected. And secondly, a more rigorous policy of control So there were more supervision, more observation from the authorities, more fines. And these two measures had big effect. So, and led to a big reduction in 2012, until 2012. You can see 2012. I don't know if you can see it. Well, 5,000 square meters in, in one year. Or 5 million. And then... Uh, deforestation raised again last year, actually twice as much from 2012. So this will go on, as far as we know. Uh, so 2012, it started going up again. So it started with the Dilma government. But the, it was a clear rise uh, already in the first year of the government of Bolsonaro more than 9,000, uh, uh, 9, 9 million uh, square meters. So this, this trend uh, of this rise of this forest will go on. These are not good news, but we know at least historically that it is possible to reduce deforestation but with a of, of, of course with a, a bolsonaro government that won't be possible uh, this is a, there's always a war of numbers the official numbers uh, which are special from the special official agency the, the, the those were always used by the government but then both But Bolsonaro now stopped uh, stopped presenting or presenting the numbers or, or the official numbers that were from a, an official agency, a national agency, and is presenting the, their government's, uh, uh, their own government's uh, numbers. Or, so shall we go ahead? Unfortunately, I cannot see the presentation. Well, there's also the scientific... Uh, data, images, satellite images. What are deforested, deforested areas? Here they are. You can see here. Let's, let's go back again on the second picture. Here, here. 
No, that's you're going you're going further. No. To the second. Oh, I, I can't see the, the images. No. Well two thirds of the deforestation areas are uh, uh, agribusiness well cattle raising and, so, and also from uh, soya uh, and corn or mice first you have the uh, the pasture and then the the production of um, of soya and mice So, it's also important to mention that two-thirds are used for farming and cattle grazing, and these are a uh, deforested area. And other areas are also used to build certain uh, villages. So in scientific studies, we see who are the big owners, those who do deforestation. The, the small ones also do deforestation, but mostly the deforestation is due to big owners, landowners, because they have big interests. And you, you know that Amazon is in the hands of big owners. So there's not much of a questioning here, and mostly this deforestation is illegal. Th there is, uh, uh, well, each owner has the right to deforest 20% of its land, yes, but uh, most of the deforestation these days is illegal. All the forest fires, or most of them, are caused by human hand. So these are not natural forest fires. It, it, they exist, of course. They always existed. But this number of forest fires, numerous forest fires, these are, have a hand, a human hand on it. Can we go on to the following picture? Well, two uh, issues here that are less clear. On top of deforestation of big areas that have impact in the forest, and then you have the illegal logging which is uh, to get wood for uh, illegal export. And that is visible in the satellite images. So I have big doubts on the size or dimension of this illegal extraction of, uh, 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 of wood, of uh, logging. We, we can imagine it's much bigger, the impact. And then also, it's the, the mining also have a big impact, especially the illegal, illegal mining of the Amazon uh, of gold. So not so much impact in the deforest area, but on the ecosystems, because an illegal mine does not deforest on the area but it's a big impact on the pollution of the rivers. So we cannot limit the, 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 the impact, uh, the environmental impact to the deforestation of big areas. There is also these uh, other elements that contribute for a negative impact. Can we go further, please, for the next picture? This is a very interesting image that this pink uh, 
this is an indigenous area. It's a national park. It's an, uh, the, one of the oldest or the oldest uh, indigenous area, more than 50 years. Uh, you have several families. This is Mato Grosso, the production of, uh, of soya in Brazil. And here you see that indigenous territory works as a, as a, as a break as a, a border for this uh, for deforestation of course you have some areas of planting of farming but there is you can see a, a clear forest a, a clear border here a limit to deforestation thanks to this natural park so the indigenous land work as a break to deforestation so these are small other areas of conservation these are two other indigenous areas and well deforestation is less in this deforestation areas and this is clearly explained in my study that you can uh, use for the next picture please well you have an example the national park and this is a total amazonia this is kind of brown pink um, these are indigenous lands in green in several uh, several types of green you have a conservation areas as well the, I, I said that already in previously this is a lot of land 45 percent of the land of the amazon are, are indigenous land 2.5 square me, uh, square kilometers 2.5 square kilometers well, four times France, seven, thousand, seven times Germany. So it's a lot of land. And this land is protected. And not all protection works. This is, of course, is a very, uh, an area that most, a lot of people want. But so it's a lot of land. And with Bolsonaro declared, that you would fight against these indigenous areas because it, it, it says it's non-productive they, they're not worth they don't they're not good but these are indigenous territories can we go uh, further to the next image please so the question of deforestation the question of land the forest fires in Amazon are not symbols of irrational irrationality of the human being. It's a, it's a, pro, a, a very rational process of a, of human. It's land grabbing, and today Amazon is the biggest uh, the biggest plot of land grabbing in the world. So deforest land is still today a mechanism to appropriate land to, uh, to, and then transform it into a property, into uh, production, into either cattle grazing or, or farming or logging even. If we want to address the causes of deforestation, we have to check these uh, facts. So one more observation. Well, Terra is in the center. Terra, after the, there's also a process of using uh, after Terra. Terra is the soil. Then you have the seeds, soya. And this means, 
Uh, then you have, of course, you have Monsanto with the seeds. You have Bayer, or Bayer, BSF, also. And I'll, 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 I'll finish as one of my last comments, and I'll, I'll be finishing. And then we have the machineries, and then we have the harvest of the soya. And all this is in Amazon. And every all companies are in Amazon exporting. It's also our responsibility. So this is start us all starts with deforestation, but then there's a complex mechanism. There's a big presence of multinationals of international companies. So I'll I'll end up here, and I'll I won't have to comment the last slide. I'm sure Maureen has a lot of things to say as well. I'm certainly a lot of the those who are attending today have a lot of experience that can share also with the audience. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for these insights. Um, and I'm sorry to um, have you cut short. Um, for those that are interested, please uh, make sure that you download um, the, the entire study um, and read it. There are very many um, very interesting facts in there um, and it's explained very well and understandable um, for a larger audience. So please download and, and share. Um, I have now the pleasure to announce the first um, speaker that will make a comment on the study. Um, and this is Mr. Um, Paolo Garzotti. He is an Italian national and after a law degree, he started his career in the European Commission already back in 1994. He is now the um, head of the Latin America unit of the Directorate General for Trade at the European Commission. And before that, he has served as deputy permanent representative of the European Union mission to the World Trade Organization in Geneva. So he really is a trade expert. Um, so please, um, Mr. Paolo Garzotti, um, what is the position of the EU Commission on the Amazon question? How does the European Commission intend to align trade with the European Green Deal objectives? And yes, please, please share your insights on the study. The floor is yours. You just have to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Here you are. It's very silent, I think. Can you speak up? Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, most, you, yes, you okay, perfect. Um, as, you, as you said, I was saying in your, uh, in your introductory remarks, um, a, uh, I, I, just, I joined uh, the, the Mercosur uh, Latin America unit here in Digital Trade only a couple of weeks ago. So for me, uh, a meeting like this one is a great opportunity to uh, learn, to um, understand better the, the, the issue. Uh, at the same time, um, I'm, uh, I'm of course, uh, as you said, a trade expert. Uh, so in, in terms uh, uh, of commenting on the great work uh, that uh, your expert uh, uh, and the Hungry Bird Foundation has done, uh, I will be able to add little, of course, uh, to the uh, to the multidisciplinary uh, analysis that he has made. Uh, I will have to stick mostly to the uh, to the trade uh, uh, element. Indeed, what I see is that uh, in in Brazil, and I think the problem with the um, Amazon forest is not just only for Brazil. That is not simply an environmental problem. It is an historical problem which has uh, uh, human rights, land appropriation dimension. It's, it's fundamentally a governance uh, problem. In a similar uh, conversation uh, I had with, with uh, um, another group interested in the matter, uh, they were basically saying that Brazil has the institutional uh, abilities and institutional uh, uh, elements in place for fighting this kind of problem, but it doesn't use this. Um, 
I was struck by one particular aspect of the study uh, of um, uh, of Thomas, the the what he calls the the difference between drivers and causes in differentiation, the way they interplay, and uh, the, the 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 fact that for understanding uh, the problem, uh, you have to understand these elements. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to uh, uh, find the right solutions. Uh, one of the key to this uh, could be trade. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed by the fact that the, that the report uh, quotes trade and in particular the EU Mercosur agreement just one and it puts forward the simple uh, equation that this agreement is simply, if you allow me to define this like this way, a uh, cow for cars equation, no? where we, uh, we allow them to send more beef and we send them more cars which I think is reductive and doesn't cover the uh, real spirits and the geostrategical uh, um, interest of this agreement. So I, I go back, if you wish, and if you allow me, because that's what I know, uh, in, into how the disagreement, which is the one I'm responsible for, could help uh, in addressing uh, uh, the problems and being a, a tool and not a threat to uh, address the problems that, uh, as rightly pointed out to the report, are uh, uh, old problems uh, which have been um, uh, there for a long time and will necessitate a, a, uh, a you know, holistic approach uh, in order to be sorted out. Um, first of all, um, is uh, this agreement is, is, is important for us and we think is important because it's, it, we are the first one to sign an agreement with this region and we sign an agreement with uh, uh, a strong uh, sustainable development chapter. Not as strong as most of the people probably listening now would have hoped, uh, not as strong as actually the European Union would have hoped when you start negotiating. Um, an anecdote, the, um, the, one of the first uh, negotiators of the Trade and Sustainable Development chapter uh, told me recently is that when he first showed up um, in the mid, um, uh, in 2005-2006, uh, to discuss the Trade and Sustainable Development chapter with the, the Mercosur, uh, the Brazilian negotiator didn't show up physically. They say, we don't think there should be any chapter, so we don't see the point of negotiating it. This is where we came from. And we got, uh, anyway, a deal uh, which includes uh, commitments, legally binding commitments, even if uh, not enforceable to, through sanctions, with on MEAs, on ILO, um, International Labour Office Fundamental uh, Conventions, uh, Responsible Business conduct and uh, collaboratory actions on deforestation free supply chains. Um, true, we don't have the sanctions. This is a criticism that we have received many times. Uh, we, uh, there's a debate on that. Um, we have been seeing uh, recently uh, that uh, those uh, uh, big trade partners in the world that have been trying to impose their vision of the world um, by slamming trade uh, sanctions for uh, good or less good reasons have not been very effective, to be honest. They, they, they took the, the, uh, the headlines, uh, they probably got some political appreciation at home, but in terms of efficacy and effic on the ground, uh, uh, not much. Um, so we uh, remain convinced that the best way is to have that, is to have them legally binding, and to uh, try to use the agreement as a as a tool to uh, uh, to create pressure around uh, around uh, um, those issues. This being said, uh, uh, we are worried about what's going on in Brazil, and and uh, and um, executive vice president is now responsible for the uh, trade portfolio in the European Commission has been saying this in not unclear terms. Uh, to the European Parliament uh, uh, at the time uh, of his uh, um, hearings. Um, we need, what he said is that clearly we need to see uh, an improvement on the ground uh, 
of how, uh, uh, in particular, Brazil and the Mercosur countries uh, uh, address the uh, environmental and deforestation problem uh, uh, at home. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, the, the, the instruments are, are there and, and, and it is a matter uh, of political will. Now, I heard the, the former Thank president. Thank you, Paola. C can, you, can you please um, finalize, like, say your, your last um, words for the, your political comment, and then you, we will come back to all sure. the kinds only, of questions around Mercosur uh, in the panel. My only, I, I finish with this. My, my, my final comment is that we are worried, as I said, about that. And what I would uh, be grateful as well to obtain from this conversation is uh, how uh, can we uh, uh, make sure that this agreement uh, is a vehicle to transmit uh, our values, uh, environment and others in our relation with Mercosur to make sure that is our agenda that uh, primes in the in in, in this in this um, with this region, uh, and we don't leave the ground open to uh, other great traders, actually much bigger traders with this region, who might not, uh, as we have seen, have the same uh, priorities uh, in terms of uh, environment, labor, and human rights. Grazie mille, Paolo Garzotti. Thank you so much. Um, we will definitely come back to the question around the EU-Mercosur uh, trade deal during the panel discussion because I think there will be uh, different opinions and it's, al it al it's always very valuable to exchange on these different views and to learn from each other and the different perspectives. Um, we now have a comment by a member of the European Parliament. Um, her name is Anna Cavazzini. She's a German politician and has been a member of the European Parliament since 2019. And she serves um, in the international in the Committee on International Trade. And in addition to her comedy assignments, she is part of the Parliament's delegation for relations with Brazil and to the Euro Latin American Parliamentary Assembly. Unfortunately, Anna had to cancel um, rather last minute due to a postponement of an inter comedy meeting that was related to the pandemic. Um, but she was kind enough to leave us a video message. Um, and I'm kindly asking uh, the technical support to now play that video for all of us. And we will then have another amazing person um, to represent the European Parliament during the panel discussion. So now, Anna, as a video message. I cannot hear. And oh, I can. Brazil, and I cannot be at your event today because we're having the committee meeting at the same time. But for the Greens, um, hello, my name is Anna Cavazzini. I'm a member of the European Parliament um, for the Greens and member of the International Trade Committee and of the Brazil delegation. I cannot be at your event today because we're having committee meeting at the same time but um, thanks for letting me contribute with this little video i want to update you on, on our initiatives here in the european parliament when it comes to the amazon um, what i try to do in the past is help the activists on the ground with a lot of yeah, like publicity and media work I tried to um, gather in the European Parliament um, members who are concerned with the Amazon and wrote a joint letter to the um, Brazilian Parliament, actually. Um, and the concerns expressed our concern about the model in the Amazon region. I also managed to get a plenary debate here in the European Parliament on um, so you see, we try to create some some noise, we try to create some publicity around the topic. Um, for example, in our green group meeting this week, we invited some better future activists um, who are active on on an Amazon campaign. Um, try to connect the civil society. On political grounds, one of the biggest parties around is of course um, the Mercosur agreement. Um, we all know this agreement will even worsen the catastrophe um, because of 
increased agricultural production um, and so on and so on. Um, I think I don't have to explain how bad Mercosur is. I can just tell you that um, we had a major victory um, two days ago here in Mexico that um, says the Mercosur agreement cannot be ratified as it stands past. Um, and so now for the first time we have a position of the European Parliament against the Mercosur agreement. And this is a major victory, a major step forward. Of course, the agreement is not stopped and it's not bad yet. I mean, there will be a lot of um, discussions in the background in the Council with the Commission, um, which describes include an annex or some action plan and then try to convince the European Parliament and the critical member states that we can still vote in favor. So our green position is that the Mercosur agreement cannot be rescued with just a non-binding annex or a protocol or an action plan. And if we want to really have it at the end, if we want to have a good agreement, there needs to be um, binding mechanisms against deforestation and against the climate and of course also against human rights violations. Um, the second thing that is happening at the moment um, is a very interesting piece of legislation on deforestation-free supply chains. So the Environment Committee of the European Parliament already voted on a very good own legislative proposal um, on deforestation-free supply chains. Um, and the next plan will vote on this um, resolution. So, if this resolution goes through, um, the European Parliament has a very clear task to the Commission that is presenting um, a, a piece of legislation that makes sure all the products which enter in the market are anti-fragmentation free. This could also be a major step forward. Um, third um, piece of legislation or like political um, yeah, uh, decision we are working on is an overall horizontal due diligence legislation. So um, we, um, as Greens, but also some other groups, are pushing already for years um, on that. This legislation companies or companies active on the EU market, they need to check for major human rights violations and also environmental um, violations, basically, uh, and also the entire supply chain. And this will also have, um, if it comes through at the end, um, a positive impact on, on what's happening in the, the Amazon region. So these are like the main political processes at the moment in, in the European Parliament. Um, again, I'm sad that it cannot be a clear discussion because, of course, I'm always open also to new ideas. Otherwise, I'm welcome also written input if you want to write to my office with concrete ideas on what else we can do. I'm very happy. Um, to take this up and um, yeah, have a great seminar. So that was the video input um, by Anna Cavazzini. If you have any questions, you can either um, write directly to me or to her office. Um, we will now um, have a representative from the Brazilian um, civil society. Her name is Maureen Santos, and she is a coordinator of the National Advisor Group of FASE, um, which is the Federation of Organs for Social and Educational Assistance. She is also a lecturer in the International Relations Department of PUC Rio um, University and coordinator of the Environmental Platform at BRICS Policy Center. And she was also a former program coordinator of social and environmental justice in the Rio de Janeiro Office and Education. So please, Maureen, what are the major concerns of people living in the Amazon region? And would you like to elaborate um, on anything specific of the study and also answer maybe the first political comments that were already made? The floor is yours. Okay, are you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody. I will speak in Portuguese, but first I would like to thank you a lot uh, for Heinrich Paul Foundation for this invitation, this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, and also, and I want to say hello to Gabi Coopers and Paolo Garzini, and of course, Thomas Fatawe, and for this brilliant study. Uh, so I will keep in Portuguese. <laughs> Um, então, boa tarde para quem está nos ouvindo. Um prazer estar aqui com vocês em representação 
Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. The study that Thomas just showed us is very important because it shows different Amazons. Uh, our Amazonia is uh, usually seen as a, a single thing, while there are multiple realities, and this study shows this diversified reality, all these elements that uh, characterize this region, which is the home of so many peoples. Uh, about what is happening today is a tragedy. Uh, in relation to anti-environmental uh, policies by Bolsonaro and also the uh, Mercosur free trade ag agreement that, that I will also speak about in five minutes. Thomas in his study and Paolo also mentioned this as an important element, this difference between deforestation uh, factors and causes. And uh, 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 he said that it's all about the land. And yes, the land is at the core of this debate, uh, the deforestation uh, and uh, the, the causes for the deforestation. And th what are the conflicts about this land ownership in the Amazon and how they these conflicts about ownership lead to impacts on uh, loss of biodiversity, the environmental damage, water contamination, soil contamination, and the uh, uh, livelihoods of the indigenous peoples in the in the region, in the, this uh, large region which is the Amazon. Thomas, uh, in his, uh, his mentions or he raises questions about the consumption of meat, of beef in developed uh, regions, and uh, the choice, the choi economic choices that end up favoring sectors like um, farming, uh, agro farming, that will benefit from the damaging of Amazon, and how free trade also provides um, a contribution, also gives a contribution to this destruction of. Uh, Amazon biome. So these are important issues we should take into account and that the study raises. Another element I want to highlight is uh, uh, the, the rebate about agrotoxic um, materials and how we can help solving the problem. Some details related to the um, Mercosur agreement, the free trade agreement that was ended, that was celebrated in June last year, but it, uh, it has not yet been ratified or signed and there is plenty, there are plenty of um, comments against in the European Union, in the Mercosur countries. Um, be it from the parliamentarians or from the civil societies. And this is because of the concern that this agreement may aggravate the, situ the already bad situation we have. In the case of Brazil, the situation we have in Amazonia. Last week, this uh, cooperation agreement that we had not access to, and it was finally uh, publicized, it was finally made public, now, we see that there are serious accusations that the civil society was already making in the past, even not knowing exactly the, the, the contents of the agreement. Civil society in the past 20 years, although it has been following, monitoring uh, the agreement, with some governments, the civil society had a more transparent access to, to this information. That happened in the first decade of the years 2000 in Brazil, with the previous government, with Lula government, because it was a much uh, more uh, open discussion. Now it is totally closed to the civil society and we, we do not have access to these documents. And what is published uh, online uh, comes with plenty of filters. Now, these two 
uh, last communications shows something serious is that this uh, agreement does not contain measures or clauses uh, um, that are strong enough to prevent a disaster, an environmental disaster, if the agreement is signed. First, because it does not, uh, it has binding mechanisms about the role of the main corporations that will benefit uh, from these advantages, from this free trades agreement. Another, another one point I can I can uh, uh, quote has to do with the agro toxical substances. The the the, the uh, no more tariffs on on these substances. Uh, Thomas, in part of his study, speaks about poisons produced uh, in Germany, namely by two main producers of these um, products, Bayer and Buffs in Brazil, and the agreement shows uh, that, uh, uh, um, by another Thomas, that Buffs has in Brazil 13 agrochemicals uh, uh, registered, 71 of them highly noxious, and 57 are banned, are forbidden in the European Union, but like, uh, but they are sold. They are produced in Germany and sold to Southern Hemisphere countries like Brazil. Another company, Bayer, 124 of the agrochemicals are 50, 78 are very noxious and 37 have been banned from the European Union. The agreement does not, does not claim for the principle of precaution against these measures and this may lead to an increased contamination of uh, the populations in the south because of these questions that Thomas raised. Now, regarding the other item that I'd like to highlight, Thomas speaks a lot about indigenous peoples, traditional peoples, the house in the Amazon as a house of so many peoples in these countries. And, and we understand that another uh, how it goes because okay it's my my kid my kid i'm at home my kid is talking to me yeah uh, my last point, okay, Portuguese. So my last point has to do with this, the, the free, uh, the previous consent principle that is not being observed. In the trade chapter for sustainable development, they do speak about this principle, but to include the peoples of traditional communities in this value chain, saying that there is a commitment of the parties to develop, to, to involve these uh, indigenous peoples uh, in this product chain. So they, they need, so they have their informed consent. Well, the principle is there, but this is for any use of indigenous territory and their resources, not just an economic participation. So that's how I will close my comments. Maybe later we will have more time. Congratulations for your study. Uh, uh, thank you. Obrigada, uh, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. Um, yes, you and Anna both, um, and, and Paolo, you all mentioned the Mercosur um, EU trade deal with different aspects. Um, you mentioned the, the impact of pesticides and GMOs and the increase in trade in these uh, products from Europe to the Mercosur countries. Um, Paolo's view is a little different with regards to um, the impact of other trading partners. So I would now like to open up the debate and ask all the um, speakers and panelists to request to speak so that we are all on stage together, including our um, representative from the European Parliament, um, who is 
um, Gabi Kutas, Kupas. She has a PhD in Latin American studies um, and was the advisor for international trade policy and Latin America for the Greens for um, over 28 years. Um, she's officially retired um, since August, but I think in reality she uh, remains just as active. Um, so she is a real expert on anything um, around trade um, between the European Union and the Latin American countries. Um, and as it is so timely, we should first and foremost speak about the EU Mercosur Free Trade Agreement. Um, so Gabi, are, are you? Yes, you are here. Perfect. Um, what is your um, view on the Mercosur uh, trade agreement? What do you think um, are the major impacts on Mercosur countries? Um, would it be best for the forest and its people to stop the Mercosur trade agreement entirely or give it a chance, add on to it? Um, what is your view and where are we at on the political stage with respect to the Mercosur yeah. trade agreement and to all our um, to all people that are listening, please feel free to ask all your questions uh, by clicking on messaging, and then I will forward the questions to our panel. So please, Gabi, your view on the Mercosur trade agreement. Many thanks, Lisa. Let me, uh, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this meeting and to talk about the Amazon right now and to see old friends on the screen and in the audience. Um, what was very interesting for me in the study, let me say that first, is that it draws the attention not only on what we mostly see here, and that is the burning Amazon, but also its causes beyond cows and soybeans. And that is to say, causes like uh, um, mining, like illegal logging, and like the infrastructure projects that are linked to this kind of economy, and that is dams, uh, highways, uh, electricity, and all, all what is linked to that. And this brings me to your question, and that is uh, the EU Mercosur Agreement. It is not the cause of the fires, not at all. But the fires and the EU Mercosur Agreement have the same underlying economic model. That means once the agreement is in force, the situation in the Mercosur countries will be worse and in the Amazon will be worse than now. Many people say, but once we have signed this agreement, we will have more grip on Bolsonaro, which is not at all true because we have wonderful economic relations right now the biggest industrialized German city is not Hamburg, is not Munich, it's Sao Paulo, meaning that all the German industry is there and they haven't done anything to change the situation until now, they have it done worse. Now, what is the underlying economic model? And that is an extractive model, exporting more, exporting more mining products like coal, like gold, like uh, iron, and agricultural products like soybeans, like cows or meat, maybe a little bit of pork, maize, and uh, to send there, and that is so I, that is what Paolo tried to refute, to send there our cars and car parts, maybe for the other um, markets in the Mercosur countries, destroying, for instance, the car part industry in Argentina. Uh, some people now say, as the opposition is growing to the EU Mercosur agreement, to join an interpretative, interpretative instrument to the sustainable development chapter as it is not binding. I think this is this comes far too late. It is not the problem that we have a not so very strong sustainable development chapter. The problem lies in the agreement. Take for instance TBT, which is technical barriers to trade, 
or take trade facilitation, take investment, uh, take SMEs. Let me uh, reduce it to some examples, um, what we see here. Um, if you, we, we got the soybeans, but we also got the meat from Amazon region. Uh, the agreement says that there is a self-certification of the exporters. This is withdrawing barriers that existed until now. And this means that we will not be able to see where the meat comes from, if it was grown in a nice page pasture or if it was grown um, under very feedlot-like conditions. We will not know if the soybean we give as feed was done on GMO spoiled fields because the exporter just told you that's fine and uh, proofs if this is right or wrong will be at random, meaning every year or so or every six months, which is far too little. Now, some now said, let's wait for the other part, the non-trade part, and see if this part frames the whole agreement in a way that the Paris Agreement is fulfilled, that exporters cannot do what they want, that another kind of economy is brought on track. Uh, this, these two parts of the agreement were released last Friday. No, they were not released, they were leaked last Friday. And we could see them, and we could see that they are very, very, very weak. They do not frame the economy in a way that it goes into the direction which we need now. And we need now an agreement that goes against pandemics, that makes it impossible to have further pandemics, meaning no further deforestation, and which curbs climate change. But there is nothing in the agreement that curbs climate change. The provisions in the trade part, they give more liberty to the companies to do what they want. They are there. So they have already done a lot of harm, but this will be deepened and the companies will, be, will have the assurance that, that what they are doing, they will do it, they will be able to do it eternally. Because if they do otherwise, um, well, they could, would only do it otherwise if there were more laws with, uh, restricting them. But these laws will not come into force because the agreement says you have the right to do this and this, to, self to be a self-certificator, to export as you want, as much as you want, and to juggle with numbers with um, <clears throat> money as much as we want. All of this has brought more and more people in Europe and in Brazil and in the other Mercosur countries to oppose the agreement. It was first a civil society more oriented on climate change, then it was the first parliaments, then it was the first governments, and now our new trade commissioner, Mr. Dombovskis, has already said, hmm, let's see, the German presidency wanted to pass the agreement to ratification in its council meeting on 9th of November. That will not happen anymore. The agreement is most likely to pass on to the next EU presidency, which is Portugal. But this does not mean that the risk is over. This means that the risk is at another moment, but it is not a small risk, it is the same one. Um, I think that's Thank it. You, Gabi. Yeah. Thank you for the moment, Gabi. Yes, as you said, um, the, there is more and more opposition growing against that um, agreement. As you said, first civil society and then more and more um, national governments as well. And the MEPs have very recently spoken um, against the, the, the agreement in its current form. Um, so I would like to address the question back to, to Paolo Garzotti as well. Um, 
what is your what is your stance on that? Will it still um, be possible to to be ratified anytime soon? What is the Commission's strategy? And also, um, please take a stance on um, what Anna Cavazzini said in her video message on um, requirements of due diligence and deforestation-free value chains. Um, what is what is ongoing work at the Commission um, on these um, issues as well? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you to all the other speakers. Um, uh, first of all, on um, on what is the the, the commission uh, uh, strategy is not me. We'll have to talk about it. Of course, we have the executive vice president already been saying this clearly in the parliament, and uh, what the parliament has been uh, uh, deciding uh, in. Um, uh, in adopting an amendment uh, to the uh, um, resolution on the common commercial policy of the union is fundamentally confirming that uh, the situation that is now on the grounds uh, needs to be assessed and redressed to a certain extent uh, in order to move towards uh, uh, the ratification of the agreement. This is what has been saying. At the same time, uh, the vice president has indicated that renegotiating the agreement would not be a, a good uh, a good option. So for the time being, uh, uh, I would not see that uh, as um, as a, a, as a possibility. Um, I think there's um uh, there's a lot of expectation, maybe too much, uh, put on the account of trade. Uh, if this agreement, Miss uh, um, um, Kupers Gabi, he was talking about soy, for example. Soy enters the European Union today at zero percent duty. The agreement will not change anything as we go out the production of soy. Beef, we have created a, cop, uh, a quota for the, 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 the high-level beef uh, of 99,000 tons of beef. Uh, now already they enter 120,000 tons in uh, in Europe. What most likely is going to be happening is that they will sell the same amount of beef and they will make a bigger margin. So there's not going to be additional trade. The study by Thomas showed that the role of the European Union in actually creating uh, in, in, as an export market for this country uh, is relatively uh, minor, if not unexistent, but uh, minimal compared to the others. So the idea of going there with a kind of patronizing style and saying, we know what, what is good for you. We know what we want uh, you to do. And either you do this or uh, there's not going to be a deal or in the case of sanctions, I'm going to decide uh, if you are respecting your um, your agreements, is we don't think that's going to be working. The objective is the same. What we want is a Brazil that actually enforces its Paris commitments and actually reduces or stops deforestation. The problem is, do you do it by staying in Europe, uh, reneging on an agreement that we have concluded uh, at political level, uh, uh, with a broad support in 2019 and saying now to have to fix it because the current government is um, not doing what we ex would expect to do it in environmental policy. Um, this agreement has been the European Commission and Brazil and the Mercosur countries is not between one president of the European Commissioner and and and, and and president, for example, Bolsonaro. So w I'll, what I'm trying to contribute to this, uh, to this conversation, I understand I'm the only one, is let's see if by creating uh, the, the, the channels, uh, by creating a situation where, you know, we could, uh, if things that don't, uh, and we have this agreement in, in place, we could be able to challenge Brazil or the Mercosur country in a panel, in front of a panel of experts, uh, for not implementing ILO uh, environmental uh, um, conventions, including the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement, as we know, doesn't have in itself uh, any dispute settlement system, any binding nature, and is made of voluntary commitments. 
I'm, I'm not saying that we go uh, <laughs> the solution on the silver bullet. We consider uh, that this could be a mean to promote a value agenda. The alternative, I fear, so when I look at the alternative, is surely a loss of credibility as a negotiating partner uh, for the European Union, because that will mean that. And um, other uh, players will step in. And we have seen in other parts of the world, we have seen uh, uh, what does it mean to disengage and not, and, and not to be able to take the first mover advantage. But I totally agree there must be different, there can be different views. And what I would like to have as an advice, but for the time being, I, I, what I receive is, uh, in any way, disagreement will increase trade, trade will increase deforestation, so the agreement is bad. If that is the question, uh, it is clear and is a point of view. I believe that there are ways to leverage disagreement in a manner that can uh, eventually become a tool by which the European Union, where, uh, I mean, where, where the values on, on environment and uh, recently the, the, the Commission has proposed, proposed an even greener set of objectives, uh, so we are leader in this, um, can, can be promoted. Um, that, that's a view and we hope we're going to be able to, to be that, to be there once, one day. And I will need, uh, and for, that's why for me it's very precious to, to listen, uh, particularly to the, to the complex analysis of Thomas, to see how we can address uh, the values issue uh, and, 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 and make sure that the governance in those countries is such that, uh, that we can all benefit. Sorry if I've been a bit too long. No, thank you, Paolo, for your for your insights. So I will um, give the floor back to Maureen and, and Thomas, our experts um, from the ground, so to speak. Um, do you, yeah, you have now the opportunity to answer um, to, to the comments that were just made and um, maybe also elaborate a little bit further on, um, Thomas, you, in your study, you also say that trade does play a role in deforestation and land degradation, but it's not a total game changer either. Um, the EU policies are not um, a major, major factor. So what else needs to change um, on the ground? Thomas and Maureen. Uh, uh, Sima, also coming, coming inside, Maureen will say... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then Maureen, you'll, you'll probably complete uh, add to what you think is needed. I, uh, with, I made this study before the signature in 2019. So, at the time, in 2019, there was not, there's not a lot of tension in Mercosur, or in 2018, the beginning of 2019. Actually, uh, thinking about the, the, the 90s uh, negotiations at the time, I also I always thought that this, this, type, this agreement was for my children, for my, for my grandchildren. And this was a gr big surprise. I think May or June 2020, or 19, sorry, the, 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 the agreement was signed. So it was a big surprise. So all this discussion that we had here had a symbolic uh, value. So B Bolsonaro declared that this indigenous land could be taken by, by others is the worst we could get. So we have to think about the symbolic value of this. This is much more important than those detailed questions or issues that we discussed here about the trade, yes or no. And I'd like to also agree with Paolo, uh, the question of paternalism. Uh, I don't think, well, cancelling the agreement is not going to save, or it's not going to find a solution. It's not going to be the solution for the social conflicts in Brazil. 
so my, for my 18 years in Brazil, I always learned that I should trust in the Brazilian agents, actors, in the, uh, the Brazilian justice, and this is the only way to follow. There's a very active and strong social uh, society in Brazil, and these actors need support. I heard that uh, President Bolsonaro declared lately that the NGOs in Brazil or in Amazon are a cancer. So has a, a president that is capable of saying such things This is a very clear sign in their policies that with these present policies in Brazil, it is impossible to come to agreements. So there's an internal uh, pressure in Brazil to change what has been uh, done by the present government. So this is a, a comment and my own opinion as well. And Maureen, well, this is very important what this decision uh, uh, that was taken last year, uh, the data that we have about deforestation and about the, the forest fires. And now we have the, the forest fire seasons. That's what we called uh, in Brazil. This is used by man. Uh, and of course, uh, obviously not naturally, Amazon would not have these natural forest fires because it's a humid forest. So, so and now we had more forest fires in the Pantanal, another area. So the, this question of symbolism is very important because if this agreement is to be ratified by the EU within the next few months so during the, the, the present uh, presidency or the next uh, the Portuguese presidency, this is a, it's giving uh, pricing to the Bolsonaro government. This is agreeing with this government that they can do whatever they want and go on doing what they are doing. And more serious, like Thomas said, uh, how can we defend ourselves? There's a deregulation in Brazil. All the legislation that were uh, that was protecting uh, uh, the environment is now being destroyed. So, and this agreement is not going to save that. From the moment that you have these national laws that will create or be give uh, uh, um, a green light to more deforestation, uh, we're lost. Uh, we have to create safeguards. So, I also agree with Paolo. The um, trade agreement is not going to save the environmental problems that we have. And this is a, an uh, this is a, a, a trade commerce, a trade deal. This is not a, an environment deal. Uh, so we have to be focused on that. Uh, we have uh, climate uh, conventions. And what I do in uh, my organization, you agree that a free trade agreement uh, uh, is not going to reinforce uh, any uh, protection of the, the environment. But the type of trade that it promotes, and with this uh, present model, this trade this agreement will uh, allow, will go on allowing these type of tragedies that we are living in uh, the Amazon with more deforestation, of course, with uh, the agreement of all the agribusiness uh, and all the illegal loggings and the big, big, huge companies from the world. So this is this is symbolic what's happening. And this is something we have to go on discussing. We should reinforce and support the civil society in Brazil. I totally agree with Thomas. There's so many violations of our rights. Um, there's social movements. There's uh, social movements from the traditional people uh, defending their own territories. So 
this is the reason why we should all have these spaces that we have here virtually to be able to speak up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maureen, you mentioned the participation issue of civil society organizations. And um, I do not speak Portuguese, but that's what I understood from the question that is um, asked in the chat. Um, would you mind, Maureen, um, reading that question out loud and then answering it or forward it to anyone else, please? Thank you. Okay, let me check. Uh, they ask, like, uh, how can you talk about environmental clauses in a country that the environmental minister uh, uh, just reduced in an important council, that's the National Council on the Environment, the participation of civil society, and also they, uh, they cut off some laws of environmental protection. And also, how can you have to take in consideration that in, in relation to the agreement European Union Mercosur, you don't talk only about Amazon, but also about Cerrado and Pantanal, that's other biomes, that this year they have one third of their area burned. Uh, so this is, is, is a very important commentary because it's like that that I was talking about, and just speaking, sorry. I keep going, uh, that we have the, this uh, environmental deregulation in course in Brazil. There is a process that is very deep right now that didn't start with Bolsonaro government, but increased a lot during Bolsonaro government. And this is really uh, co complex. And at the same time, it's not only about our regulation uh, or legal framework, because they are put and they really destroy institutional space that work to support the environmental protection in the country and and they, we don't have anymore any council that uh, related to environmental debate that you really can have a different uh, voice of civil society that can op create opposition to this process because right now they cut off all these councils that you have this space for debate and this space to discuss public policies and they reduce a lot uh, the, the space uh, for the, the, the opposition for the civil society. We have, of course, cross in the media and in the debates, but the official spaces that we have before to dis debate the public policies and the law uh, uh, for the, in the instance of executive, we don't have anymore. Uh, for other issue, we have the parliament, the Brazilian parliament, and this is a very important sector also to support. And in the instance of the progressive deputies and the parliamentaries that is put in the debate and uh, using the space of the parliament to protect what we still exist in our environmental law. So we have the sector of civil society that's really important, but using uh, as, as we're in a debate with the European Union Parliament, it's also important to increase the dialogue between the, the, the parliamentary space so I think this can be an also a good uh, opportunity to support uh, this situation and be against the situation we're living right now in Brazil and support the sector. Okay, thank you very much for, for jumping in and helping me understand the question. Um, looking at the time, it's actually already um, time to wrap up. So I would like to give all of you the opportunity for some concluding remarks. There are uh, many more issues that we haven't even touched upon. Um, I find the um, chapter of the or on the uh, Red Plus uh, very interesting too, Thomas, and anything around carbon uh, offsetting or um, compensation for um, no deforestation. Um, also with uh, the EU climate law uh, debates are picking up again. Um, so we do not have the time to talk about all these issues, but some concluding remarks and then um, our audience can also um, take more time to read the entire study to find more about the details. So let's start with you, Thomas, for concluding remarks. Um, uh, I mentioned also Yes, uh, we uh, debated the hot issue of, of the moment, which is Mercosur. We are um, aware, and this is um, consensual, that this agreement is not good. But there are many other things that uh, are worth discussing. 
um, about the international ex presence in Amazon. Uh, China, they have a tradition of international cooperation. They they created the Amazon Fund, the largest fund for rainforests in the world. And Bolsonaro just um, discontinued this fund, this Amazon fund. It stopped. So it's not just Mercosul, but there are other processes, international cooperation processes. I, I th think that the dialogue should continue with the economic sector, but uh, Bolsonaro is betting everything on the economy minister. Uh, this uh, 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 an agreement was signed uh, with the um, Minister of Agriculture, but we cannot separate agriculture from the economy and from the rest. It's a mistake if we don't see the connections between the various sectors. And that's what we have to make sure is done, that uh, 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 this, that, that everything is connected and that is taken into consideration as such. And I, I end here. Paolo, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I fear that uh, there was a bad connection because Mr. Garzotti, uh misinterpreted what I said. I said, it's not, that uh, tariffs will be lowered so that they trigger more exports. I said it is a reward for companies, companies on both sides of the Atlantic. They can do what they want without public and democratic control. It is not that uh, there will be less tariffs and more export as an effect of less tariffs. It is companies on both sides of the Atlantic can be assured that they can continue deals, economic deals, as they want to do them without parliaments or civil society intervening. And that is quite different. So if uh, Maureen talked about an award to Bolsonaro, it is not only an award to Bolsonaro, it's an award to the big corporations, to Monsanto, to Bayer, to Maggi, GBS, they can continue to Casino, Carrefour. It is the big, big European supermarkets. It is the big um, meat packing companies in Brazil. It is European car industry. It is um, car importers in Brazil. They work together. And it is not that we would say the Brazilians what they have to do. We would say the companies, they should be said by us what they have to do. And in that sense, I think Brazilians and Europeans work together against this kind of economic model and not Brazil against Europe or Europe against Brazil. At the, at the level of civil society, at the level of reasonable politicians, we work together. And the companies which work together, they should be, they should have rules how to work in order to have a healthy future without pandemics and to have a planet which doesn't suffer from more, even more climate change. Thank you. Paolo, would you like to conclude? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And, and first of all, thank. I, I just want to, to use this time to uh, thank you all for the for the contribution because for particularly for a newcomer like me this is uh, uh, an enlightening uh, kind of conversation um, 
and in particular uh, Thomas because uh, he gave uh, me the possibility to, to know the multifaceted dimension of this problem. Uh, I remain convinced, uh, contrary to Gabi, which, uh, to, with, with whom clearly I fundamentally uh, disagree, uh, what if without an agreement, uh, without an, uh, and then uh, trade will continue to go on based as it is now, um, not necessarily regulated with a couple of tariffs obstacle on top of that, that particularly for agricultural exports or for goods where already zero tariff is already going on. Uh, the agreement does actually create, for example, the obligation to set up consultation procedures and um, with civil society. So we would have a word to say if we assume that. Uh, so this this is this is what I uh, what I consider. Um, so I think is an opportunity that anyway. Uh, we need to uh, uh, exploit only, as has been said, uh, uh, in front of the parliament by the vice president, the condition on the ground are good because what the European Union wants is this trade agreement to deliver for the sustainable development of the Mercosur country and of uh, uh, the European Union. If we manage to get there and we feel like find the political uh, uh, and, and, and the support of all the people to, to get there, we will get there. Um, so this really what I wanted to, to do is thank you. Please continue doing this. Please continue feed us with this kind of input because when you are locked down in the Charlemagne uh, building, uh, uh, dealing with trade, you need this kind of information. You need this kind of reports uh, to better understand the environment we are working on and to um, and, and to adjust our views and our understanding uh, based on, 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 on what we can learn. Thank again to the Agriculture Foundation and to you, Lisa, and to all the participants. Thank you a lot for, for joining. And Maureen, very short. Any last words? And then I will conclude. Okay, I would like to thank you a lot, Lisa, and all the panelists, and Thomas. Again, congratulations for this study. I'm sorry because the brain already is going to English, not in Portuguese anymore. Uh, and, uh, and the last words is just that we keep your word here and we keep connected with civil society in Mercosur, in Europe, and we we'll do our best to disagree with them, pass like it is, because we really, I'm sure that is you complicate more and more our civil society and the conditions of the environmental and climate protection here. And not only we don't want to keep our countries uh, the forever offering uh, very cheap uh, grains and uh, to change for industrial products that must have much more value aggregated. And we really think we, we want a transformation of our economical system, our production system. And if you keep more 15 years or 25 years like that for uh, you know, with this kind of offer, uh, we cannot have opportunity to change. So, so thank you again. Yes, thank you, everyone. I think, um, yes, we have all come to understand that there are no simple answers and that we need to make efforts to really comprehend, you know, the, the complex web of things that contribute to deforestation, um, as you mentioned in your study, Thomas. And even though um, Europe and trade with Europe is not a total game changer, it does have an impact in the expansion of um, cattle ranching and, and soy cultivation. And therefore, um, the European Union also has a responsibility to act. That includes trade-related measures, um, improving free trade agreements, Mercosur um, and trade policies in more general um, terms. Um, as Anna Cavazzini mentioned, um, the work on uh, a law on due diligence for companies, um, deforestation free value chains, the EU timber regulation. There are many different legislative um, proposals on the table. But it, it is also important to act on non trade related measures, such as um, for the European Union, adopt own um, immediate measures for climate protection in order to be credible. Um, when asking for um, for protection of forests elsewhere, um, or to promote feeding um, of European farm animals with more indigenous alternatives to imported soy, 
Um, and that also leads to the farm to fork strategy or the biodiversity strategy. So it is a very um, complex net of factors that we should all um, yeah, work on together um, as the Amazon is a global common um, that, that we all need um, and especially people on the ground. So thank you all for joining in. Thank you so much to all the panelists for having taken the time to prepare these inputs. Um, please make sure you download the study, um, spread the word and stay tuned on all the um, ongoing initiatives from climate law to, um, to Mercosur uh, EU agreement. So um, thank you for joining in. Goodbye and adios. Goodbye, everyone.